So our keynote today is Pierre de Vries. You all uh, will recognize him as the panel moderator from yesterday. He's a senior fellow and co-director of the Spectrum Policy Initiative at the Silicon Flatiron Center for Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship here at the University of Colorado. His current work focuses on maximizing the value of radio operation by managing potential and actual interference better both before and after rulemaking. He's also a visiting senior scientist at the Institute for Network Systems of Aachen University. He was a technology advisor to Harrison Wiltshire and Granis, Washington, D.C., and a senior fellow at the Annenberg Center of Communication of, of the University of Southern California. Prior to this, he held various positions at Microsoft, including Chief of Incubation and the Senior Director of Advanced Technology and Policy. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce Pierre Debris. Thanks. You know, you could say that uh, the FCC is from Mars and SDR is from Venus. And uh, it's still early in the relationship between those two. Uh, and I guess I'm here this morning to see if we can make sure that we can avoid couples therapy down the road. Um, I'm going to be trying to talk a little bit about how those two parties relate. So how the FCC might look at the SDR as a technology and how the SDR community might want to think about the FCC. So it's a real privilege to be here uh, this morning. Thanks very much to Ben uh, for the opportunity to actually speak with you today. This intersection between SDR and regulation is something I've been trying to wrap my head around for the last year or so. And really the question that I've been wrestling with is, is there something to worry about here? I don't know. Um, I'm a spectrum guy. Uh, my phys physicist originally. Uh, I'm not an SDR guy. So I need your help to understand this interaction. And I believe actually that the spectrum policy community in general needs your help to understand this too. So in terms of uh, my agenda for the talk, um, I'll sketch out how FCC decisions and thinking might affect what you do. Um, I'll explore why what you do can influence spectrum policy and how those policymakers think. And then I want to brainstorm a bit about what you could or should do about that. Uh, the goal is to um, have about uh, 15 minutes at the end for conversation, uh, for discussion. And that's probably going to be the most useful, and uh, definitely the most fun, uh, part of this session. So let's see how we do. So the first question really is, why should the software radio community, why should you guys worry about regulation? Well, in one sense, it's really obvious because all US radio operation, well, all non-federal US radio operation must conform to FCC rules. And therefore, how the FCC understands what SDR represents, the risks and the benefits and the threats, is going to determine ultimately what you can legally do with this technology. Now, just a footnote, I said FCC. I know there's a lot of people here from outside the US um, the FCC is what I know best, so I'll talk about FCC proceedings and things. I believe the dynamics are actually going to be the same in other countries and regions, but the details will be different uh, in different places. So I think the underlying issue here, as I see it, is that the promise that SDR holds is much less visible than the risks. And I'll give you a bunch of examples in a minute why I say that. But let's just think about how the FCC affects you. Uh, perhaps the one that's most visible to this community was a guideline that the FCC put out in uh, 2014 on the programmability of 5 gigahertz unlicensed uh, devices, Wi-Fi routers, other, not just Wi-Fi, other technologies as well. And this triggered a huge debate that's still ongoing about whether third-party open source Wi-Fi router firmware, like DDWRT, that's one of the taglines that's attached to this thing, whether software like that that can change the parameters, the RF parameters of radios, should be allowed to be installed by third parties. And as I understand it, the, the open source software development community was very worried that what the FCC proposed to do was going to encourage manufacturers to lock down their routers so that you couldn't use any open source upgrade. You couldn't install DDWRT, whether or not it affected the RF side of things. Uh, 
Even the FCC admitted uh, the, the head of the Office of Engineering Technology, a guy called Julie Knapp, uh, blogged at the end of last year that um, their guidance, quote, prompted a fair bit of confusion. Um, essentially, whether they were mandating that um, there was going to be a wholesale blocking of open source firmware modifications. And so they released the revision, uh, which they believe clarified what their instructions and their goals were, which is really narrowly focused on modifications uh, that can take a device out of compliance. And that's out of compliance with the radio service rules. And those are the things, and you know, these kinds of parameters will keep coming up in this talk. It's typically things like transmit power, which transmit power in which frequency range, um, out of band emissions, uh, technologies that you need to use in some bands and not in others like dynamic frequency selection and so on. But you know, the FCC's reaction to this thing, or their, their, their knee-jerk action, gives, gives one a clue about what they are actually exercised about, which is unanticipated harmful interference from devices that no longer behave the way they did when the FCC last saw them. And I'll talk a little bit about the terminal Doppler weather radar case in a minute, and that actually influenced the FCC's thinking, whether in fact substantively it had much, if anything, to do with it or not, it really influenced the FCC. So let's back off a bit. Software-defined radio, what does the FCC actually say about software-defined radio? They've been working on this probably for about 15 years now. The first uh, inquiry that I'm aware of was back in 2000. And the current rules date from about 2005. And they say things like the following. The manufacturer of a software-defined radio needs to take steps that only software that has been approved with that radio can be loaded into the radio. This software must not be allowed to allow, this, this software can't allow the user to operate this transmitter out of the FCC approved parameters. And third and perhaps most important, the manufacturer must have what they call reasonable security measures to prevent unauthorized modification of the software as it's shipped. So you can see why, with that in the back of their mind since 2005, the FCC were really worried when they saw things that were being installed on devices that seemed to change the RF parameters uh, and perhaps cause harm. The other thing that's happened uh, more recently um, is in July of last year, the FCC said, you know, it's been 10 years, it's probably time to update our rules. And the interesting thing is about those rules, those conditions that I stated for software-defined radios, um, there's, you know, only in regulation. Uh, those rules only apply to devices that are classified as software-defined radios, and the manufacturer gets to decide if they want to declare their radio to be a software-defined radio. So not surprisingly, hardly anybody did, because who wants extra rules? So what the FCC is now proposing to do is to incorporate those requirements, for example, software to control RF parameters, in their general rules. So any device that goes through certification uh, by the FCC, you, know, you, you, you turn the device upside down, there's that FCC logo on the back that says this thing has been certified. Any of those devices have to now satisfy these rules about security features and unauthorized changes and so on. Now you hear about those kinds of things, and well, at least to me, that sounds really draconian, right? So it's like, it, it doesn't compute. So how can you possibly do all this really great stuff that you are doing with GNU Radio, given all these conditions? Um, again, only in regulation. It turns out that there are exemptions, and there are exemptions for test equipment. So those rules don't apply to equipment that is sold as test equipment. And guess what? The hardware that you're using has been sold as test equipment. So those rules don't apply to USERPs or HackRFs or Lime SDR or any of those kinds of things. Yet. Now, I'm not saying there's any indication right now that the FCC is going to remove that exemption for test equipment, right? And so that, that's going to change what you can do with GNU Radio. But what you have to think about, and you know, you all, uh, you know, you co-defensively, you think about all the possible things that can go wrong. 
What if the FCC did? Or what if circumstances changed? What if there was some hack that happened that frightened all the old white guys in Congress that said, oh my god, the FCC needs to do something about that? So my contention is that this community needs to start thinking about what the regulator might do. So why might the regulator worry about SDR? I'm going to just give a few examples. I'm not saying that any of these stories that I'm going to give you are valid justifications for imposing SDR rules or new SDR rules. I'm not even saying that SDR necessarily is the root cause of the problem. But these are the kinds of things that are what the lawyers like to call a parade of horribles. Right? It's the kind of stuff that could predispose or scare the regulator to make bad rules. And I want you to listen to these things, not with your own ears, but imagine that you're a policymaker. So imagine that you're an FCC commissioner. Right? So you're a lawyer, and you're a political appointee, and you're going to be called up to Capitol Hill to be grilled by Congress if anything goes wrong. Right? If there's something that happens like you know, a plane accident, or somebody's murdered and an SDR was used to disable their home security system. Right? So, so that's what the world you're in. Or let's imagine you're an FCC staffer. So you're an engineer. You have a profoundly deep knowledge of traditional RF. But you really don't know all that much about software. And you need to figure out what your boss, what, what the commissioner needs to worry about. So the first story is about airport weather radar. There's something called terminal Doppler weather radar. Uh, it's used to detect hazardous wind shear and other climatic conditions that affect planes. Typically, w well, wind shear uh, is, what it, is what you can figure out it says. Um, it's a rapid change in wind speed. It tends to occur uh, close to the ground, and it's invisible to a pilot. So they can't see wind shear as they're on final approach. So radars are used at more than 45 different major airports in the US, including Denver. And I suspect a lot of you flew in from Denver, through Denver, to essentially detect wind shear and alert the pilots, you know, go around, try a different approach. It's dangerous. And this kind of stuff, it's not the biggest risk to aviation. But every year, there's you know, five to 10 of these t, uh, uh, wind shear related accidents. So it's something that you should worry about if you fly. Early in 2009, uh, the FAA became aware of degradation in terminal Doppler weather radar. The operators were like seeing noise on their screens. So they actually sent out a team from the NTIA's uh, ITS lab, just down the road from here, there's a, there's a huge complex in the Department of Commerce, so some of the best RF engineers in the country are right here. So they sent these guys out to figure out what the problem was, and these guys did a lot of work, wrote three reports, and it turns out that the interference was due to uni uh, Wi-Fi, not, not Wi-Fi actually, some of them were canopy, uh, base stations that were transmitting in this band. So the Doppler radar operates in the Uni2 band, where you've also got unlicensed operation. And the way that the radars are typically protected is that the, the uh, unlicensed device does dynamic frequency selection, DFS. It looks for a radar signature. If it sees the signature, it shuts down. Well, it turns out, and there's a lot of speculation, and some of this stuff has been redacted and hidden as to why these radars didn't work the way they should. In at least some of the cases, it was related to the software that, that essentially controlled DFS being disabled. And some of it was because maybe a password got out or was given out, or because people bought equipment overseas and brought it in and DFS was switched off. But anyway, this was a software problem that put aviation at risk. The second example is GPS. Uh, GPS, civilian GPS, is really vulnerable to spoofing and jamming. Uh, and that's facilitated by software-defined radio. Now, obviously, this is really worrying because 
a lot of critical infrastructure depends on GPS. It's, you know, it's not just me figuring out you know, where I am and where I need to drive, but it's landing planes, navigating container ships into harbors. Uh, the LTE system, as I suspect all of you know, uh, you know is, it uses very precise timing, and it uses GPS for the timing. And unfortunately, GPS is a really fragile system. In a way, it's badly designed. There's a lack of resilience and fallbacks. So for example, there's a system called eLoran, which is an upgrade of the old terrestrial navigation system, uh, which is being used in some places now as a fallback for GPS. It's terrestrial, it's higher power, the signal doesn't come from the satellite. Um, the US started decommissioning its LoRaN stations in 2010. Fortunately, enough people figured out that this wasn't a good idea. They've stopped, uh, and there have now been recommendations to actually do e -Loran. So we'll see. But until recently, uh, spoofing GPS used to be the preserve of really sophisticated, well-funded research groups. But you know, at DEF CON last year, there was a group of Chinese researchers that showed you could spoof GPS using you know, a USERP, LADARF, HackRF. So anybody with that equipment could make uh, a big piece of you know, equipment like a plane or a boat uh, drive into something it shouldn't drive into. So again, if you look at that you know, with, with your scared glasses on, it looks like some, uh, in the case where a bad actor could cause damage. And the last one I want to talk about is LTE. We all depend on LTE, but you know, if I can't complete a call, that often happens with Verizon. Uh, that's not the end of the world. The trouble is we are beginning to, and we are, as, as a country, we are deploying LTE for first responders, fire, paramedic, uh, uh, police. And there was a wonderful paper uh, earlier this year by a team at Virginia Tech that found and showed that you could, if you attacked certain protocol subsystems of LTE, so if you want to jam LTE, you know, the first thing you think about doing is you just jam the whole uplink or the whole downlink. But if you just pick certain packets, certain uh, resource blocks that control the whole thing, you need 20 to 30 dB less power to jam LTE. Uh, you know, so these guys concluded that LTE is highly vulnerable to adversarial jamming. And, you know, quote, even the most complex attacks can be easily implemented with widely available open source libraries, low cost software radio hardware with a budget of under 1500 bucks, and basic Linux programming skills, right? No surprise to any of you, but again, this might lead somebody to worry about SDR and public safety. There's lots of other examples I could, you know, I, I, this stuff fascinates me, like, you know, breaking into a house using a simple replay attack, or hacking, <laughs> hacking vehicles with the key fobs, the Volkswagens, um, the wireless key fobs. Um, actually, that, that amused, that, that's sort of, sort of relevant to me. Um, you know, these, you know, the Volkswagens are all vulnerable, lots of other vehicles too. My wife has just bought a Golf. Um, so the thing is just like, uh, honey, don't use the wireless key fob. Unfortunately, she doesn't have an option. The, go the new Golf does not have a keyhole. You have to use the wireless. All right, so stories like these, if you read them in the press and you're a policymaker, or let's just say, you know, you read them in the press, there are two ways to read them. One way is, this is cool. And that's, I suspect, how most of us read that kind of thing. And the other is, oh my god, this is scary. And when you hear these stories, you can easily put them in context, right? You understand the caveats. You know, what Paul Tilburn was saying yesterday is, you know, it's a difference between SDR in the lab and in the field. You know, it's hard to take this stuff out to do real things in the world. And you also understand that this cool stuff leads to things that people who need to be re-elected in November care about. So for example, you understand that innovation through SDR, for example, creates jobs, it creates growth. You understand that highlighting security holes makes people safer. And, you know, it's the hack that actually leads to the, the safety. But if you don't talk about this stuff, the people in DC will only think about the scary things. So that's the big picture, but why now? So why is SDR an issue now? Obviously, we're all increasingly dependent, and if you've got a VW Golf, you can't avoid wireless for security, and it, you know, airplanes as well. 
But of course, you know, pretty much every non-trivial radio now tunes over multiple bands and is programmable to such an extent. It's also a fact that SDR is getting cheaper and the tools are getting better, which means it's easier for people to find the vulnerabilities in old systems that weren't designed with this kind of thing in mind. And the exploits are easier to execute. And what it boils down to is that SDR undermines some key assumptions that underpin regulations. So one is that after the FCC has certified a radio's behavior, it doesn't change. It's like, no. And the other is that when you think about threats to critical infrastructure, like GPS spoofing or LTE jamming, that only a few really well-funded, sophisticated players have access to the technology to do that. No, not true anymore. Now we're going to get to how you might link in with the FCC. So I'd like to say a few words about my impression of how the FCC works. What's the game? Every regulator in the FCC is no, no exception, is in the business of making trade-offs. So they need to trade off safety and innovation against economic growth, against public welfare. And then they got the incumbents who are in a band and the new entrants that want to be in a band. And so they have to try and find the right balance between all of these. And so if you think back to the DDWRT case, uh, where there was this question about, you know, do we allow OSS upgrades uh, to 5 gigahertz routers? You can read it in two ways. You can say, look, you know, we need to do this to prevent interference to weather radar, right? It was, it was five gigahertz unlicensed that, that affected the radar, so we need to make sure that doesn't happen again by limiting modification. But you can also look at it the other way, which is the way in which um, the open source network security researchers who've been essentially arguing this case for this community in DC, they argue that, look, Improving the security of Wi-Fi devices by making it easy, legal, right, legally and technically, to keep equipment properly patched is a much greater benefit than the tiny risk that might be posed to airport uh, radar systems. So, trade-offs. The other thing that you have to bear in mind is when the FCC is making trade-offs, they are hearing arguments. They are hearing the best lobbying that dollars can buy. And the arguments on both sides are going to be compelling. That's you know, one of the things that I found is, you know, I, I, I look at an issue, I hear the argument, I go, yeah, that sounds right to me. The biggest mistake I make is listening to the other side, because as soon as I listen to the other side, I'm not, long, I, you know, I'm not sure anymore, because you, you know, they're well-constructed arguments. The last thing, and perhaps the most important thing that we need to bear in mind, is that the decision makers are lawyers. And they're political appointee lawyers. They're not engineers. So ultimately, the, the, the decisions that they make are on legal and political grounds, not on engineering criteria. So for example, there are terms that float around when the FCC does regulation, like harmful interference. You know, that's defined as severely disrupt, degrade, or repeatedly interrupt. It's like, you know, how do I turn that into a number? The answer is you don't. The lawyer gets to interpret that. Uh, another important thing to bear in mind here is that the law, even though people talk about the US code, it's not actually code. Uh, it doesn't have a single outcome. And when you look, what you see in the words of a regulation or a statute is not all there is. There's a lot of precedent and custom an interpretation that goes into how these words are used. So that means that you shouldn't assume that you win a regulatory argument by default just because you have the technically more correct position. So given all that, what kind of relationship might you have, you individually or you as a community, with the FCC? Just a couple of suggestions. The first thing is engage with them. Go visit. Uh, the FCC people love to hear from engineers. They hear from lawyers all the time, right? And they genuinely seek engagement on technical questions. I, you know, I work with them, and so maybe I'm biased, but that's definitely been my experience. Educate them, provide the different kinds of perspectives. 
So for example, let's go back to that DDWT 5 gigahertz router case. You know, you can say things like, and this is what the open source security guys have been saying, your concern should not just be trying to prevent bad people from doing bad things at the RF layer, but there is value in end users being able to fix flaws in these systems. So don't lock everything down. You might you know, prevent an RF problem, but you'll you know, inherit a whole raft of stuff further up the stack. You can make arguments like the risk of interference from the kind of work that happens in this kind of community is tiny. And you need to set that against uh, the, the, the benefits. And in fact, it may be that there are risks that are much more severe than you know, SDR hacks. It may be, and I don't know, that the real risk is one of the, maybe an open source distribution or more likely perhaps, uh, one of the cellular operators does a huge upgrade to the firmware and all their devices, and there's a bug in it. And it causes an intermittent RF interference problem. So you have the knowledge and understanding to mitigate these risks, right? You can help the FCC think about that. Um, typically, when the FCC looks at a problem, what they get bombarded by is the worst case, right? So the people who feel at risk come along and say, if you, if you don't stop this, this horrible thing is going to happen. And what you really need to do, and we've been work, some of us have been working with the FCC on this, and you can help, is to say, no, don't do a worst case analysis. Do a risk analysis. Don't just look at one hazard, the worst one. Look at all of them. And don't just look at the severity of the hazard. Look at the probability. You know, yeah, this might be severe, but it's a one in a 10 million chance. So you can help do that. And as a community, you can also mitigate the risks for our, all, you know, for our benefit as a whole. So you, know, you can, and I think as a community you probably should, think through the risks and the responsibilities that you have by working on SDR. I was trained as a physicist, and physicists lost their innocence with the Manhattan Project, right? The atomic bomb made physicists realize, and, you know, and, this is, and this filtered through as I was being trained, that you have to take responsibility for the consequences of the basic research that you do. It has consequences, and ultimately they're on you. Now, there hasn't been a Chernobyl or a Three Mile Island or, God help us, a Hiroshima you know, from SDR hacking, and let's hope there never is going to be one. But it's you folks who can help society avoid that. So now you can do work like, you know, some of you are doing this. Design radio protocols that are more resistant to adversarial interference. And you can grow a community of white hat hackers that work with regulators and policymakers to flag the problem. So this, the wireless hacking challenge. Uh, that Balance is working on as sponsored and organized. It, it's a wonderful idea. And you know, I'd love to see more intersection between GRCon and DEFCON and, and uh, events like that. Now, you know, I'm talking about, you know, go talk to the FCC and you say, my God, you know, go to DC. Who do I talk to? So it sounds daunting, I imagine. There are people in this community who are already engaged, who have engaged for many years. Find them and ask them. And if you're in a city where your law school, or you may, maybe have multiple law schools, have a technology law policy clinic, right? A clinic is where young lawyers work on real world problems to learn how to do law. Go and ask them for help. So here uh, in Boulder, it's CU Law. And the guy who runs a tech policy clinic is called uh, Blake Reed. And that's R-E-I-D. If you want to find him, just Google Blake Reed Colorado Law. You'll get all the contact information. Even if he can't engage directly on the project that you're working that you want to talk to the FCC about, he'd be only too happy to sort of help you figure out, like, how do you file comments? How do you schedule a meeting? How do you do this kind of stuff? Because it's relatively simple for engineers to share their insights. And you have to do that because you need to make a positive case for the stuff you want, because if you don't make your voice heard, you are going to get rules you don't like. And after that's done, it's really hard to unbake the cake. It's easier to sort of be in the kitchen while the cooking is going on. You know, you know, again, I think about the DDWRT case. 
I think the software radio community as a whole has benefited from the network security researchers who made the case. You know, they provided a counterpoint to this lock it all down narrative. That's wonderful, and you know, we should be really grateful to those guys, but it's not gonna be sufficient going forward. You can't depend on those kinds of things uh, in future. So, a couple of conclusions. Uh, FCC, friend or foe, SDR, trick or treat. Um, what's my answer? Well, SDR is a technology. So it's both trick or treat. It depends on how it's used. And FCC, friend or foe? Well, again, uh, it's a false distinction because the answer is neither. The FCC, you can think about the FCC a bit like Ben today. Right? The FCC is a conference organizer. They're trying to do the best for the whole. They're trying to create an environment where cool things can happen and the hassles are minimized, but they can't please all of the people all of the time. And the other thing is they work in terms of constraints. So in the same way that you know, Ben can't do everything he might want to do here because of the rules that you know, the, the venue imposes. You know, CU says, no, you can't have alcohol in the room at such and such a time. The FCC works under constraints as well. So uh, in their case, it's you know, Congress who makes laws that they have to fit in and takes their money away if they don't do the right thing. So my bottom line is it would be very good if you understood what the FCC worries about, the problems they have, and help the FCC to solve problems, because that's going to help you. Thanks very much. So let's move to uh, Q&A. What I'd like, you know, what, what did I get wrong? And uh, what do you think matters? So I hope there's lots of comments and questions. And uh, let's see who would like to start the conversation. All right, so a few people in the audience with mics. You just want to raise your hand if you want to. Oh, oh that's, that was Michael raising his hand saying I have a mic. All right, does anybody have any questions or comments? All right, we got a couple. Yeah, let's take a couple in series. Is the uh, FCC, they seem to only be concerned about things that can be used for, uh, you know, like uh, radios that put out more power than they're supposed to being sold at truck stops, uh, SDR, things that can cause interference on an intentional basis. Meanwhile, things like laptop power supplies, uh, grow lights, things like that, yep. that make the HF band unusable in areas yep. and other radio, they seem to just, they don't do any enforcement at all. Yep. Is there a way to rectify that? Because I think most of the issues come from unintentional radiators now. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. Uh, next, que next question, I'll come back to that. So is it safe one here and then a gentleman in the back. Is it safe to say that the FCC is primarily concerned or exclusively concerned with the capacity of an SDR to transmit? Or are they also concerned about observation and, and you know, sort of the elant world of, of listening to things and learning things that people shouldn't yes. potentially. Beautiful question. I love it. Question at the back. Um, I know the, uh, you describe the FCC as kind of like this impartial arbitrator. That's, mm -hmm. that's the ideal. Yes. But how do you address the issue of like regulatory capture and this yes. revolving door of, you know, the FCC commissioner used to be a lobbyist for Comcast. Right. Yep. That's absolutely, that's a great point. So how do you avoid regulatory capture? Good, we have any, we've got one here. Pierre, thank you for your comments this morning. Um, since you said this audience should go and visit the commission, do you wanna name names? Uh, do you wanna talk about the Columbia Labs? Um, you know, do you wanna give them a real pointer into the commission where they can reach out besides the uh, local uh, law clinics? Thanks. Right. Oh, okay, um, so if, let, let's do two more. That gentleman and then the gentleman in the room here. Yep. Um, so you didn't mention anything of the, um, the temporary license that you can get yep. by going on to, um, to the FCC website. Yes. And then there's the, you just have to fill out the, the form and pay the, the fee, and then you can get like a six months um, testing, <laughs> testing license. That's a great point. And last question for now. Um, a number of years ago when I think it was somebody was trying to set up some sort of internet service that interfered with DPS. I looked at all of the bios for the FCC commissioners and they were all lawyers. There weren't yep. any engineers. Yep. 
And I found that odd. So I, I found it odd and troubling that yes. serious policy decisions were being made without input from engineers. Yes. Join the club. All right. So wonderful. And I, th I think we're going to run out of time. I think we have time for one to address this, and then we'll see how we go. Um, so the first point was the FCC only seems to be concerned with intentional uh, interference. And you know, what about all the in unintentional? Uh, there doesn't seem to be any enforcement there. That is largely true. Uh, the, the way that enforcement, so one of the FCC on the spectrum side's goals is to avoid harmful interference. You can, you can do that in two ways. You can make rules before the fact. That's mostly what we've been talking about this morning. And then you can make sure that the rules are actually observed in the field after the fact, which is enforcement. So uh, enforcement is a huge issue. A plug down at the law school this afternoon at 1 o'clock, Silicon Flatirons, the center that I'm associated with, is doing a half-day conference about the future of enforcement and you know, how technology can improve that. But the fact of the matter is that FCC enforcement is underfunded. They recently had a big cut to their field staff. And even before the cut, they were prioritizing public safety. And if you weren't public safety, the odds that you were going to get the FCC to attend to you were low. It helped if you were a broadcaster and there was a pirate that was interrupting and they were going to call a member of Congress. But other than that, you're out of luck. So unintentional radiators is a problem. And the increase of the noise floor is a problem. Uh, the FCC Technological Advisory Council about six weeks ago put out a technical inquiry. So this was actually an inquiry put out by an advisory council, not the FCC itself, that says everybody seems to be worried about the noise floor. What evidence do you have? And how do we need to figure out how big the problem is? And oh, by the way, how bad is the problem? We've had 73 comments so far. Uh, and in fact, uh, we'd like to have more. So we're actually going to keep it open for another month. Um, that is a way, if anybody actually has data, is interested in approaching the FCC, they can actually use that proceeding to either file something or call them up and talk to them. So that was the first point on unintentional radiators. And oh, by the way, yes, the, the thing that most people complain about is unintentional. The, 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 ri the, the rising star is the wrong word. The rising boogeyman uh, is um, wall warts, um, switch power supplies. They're really horrid. And if you have the wrong switch power supply in your house, you don't get AM. Um, the next point was the FCC seems to be primarily worried about transmitters. What about observation, right? Um, a very perceptive comment. Yes, the FCC's rules, and in fact, this goes back to the ITU and the way in which all these people regulate, is they regulate transmitters. Uh, the FCC has been, in, has, has been encouraged to regulate receivers, but that's very hard, and they probably don't have the competence. And, in, and they probably shouldn't do that. So they are going to look at transmitters. I suspect they are not going to get involved in trying to understand the risk of these surveillance. But it may be that there are other agencies that will worry about that that I don't know so well. Uh, the next point was a wonderful point. Uh, actually, these were all great. Um, about regulatory capture. Uh, you know, How does one avoid regulatory capture? Well, the, the, the short answer is you don't. Uh, you, it, it's, it's a bit like the environment that you have to live in. Um, the capture happens in all sorts of different ways. The, one of the things to bear in mind is as soon as you make rules, you essentially create capture. Because by making a set of rules, you get a set of players who benefit from those rules. Those players then start making money off operating under those rules and then start lobbying the FCC. So it's an unavoidable fact of life. The, uh, the way in which one can mitigate that, uh, two things, is you, know, you try and actually pit different industries that, are di that have different interests against each other. In the other is you go visit and you provide the counterpoint, which is, so the counterpoint from a community like this will be disproportionately influential in DC because you don't really have an ax to grind. You are perceived as neutral and uh, as, as engineering experts. So you have more weight than the lobbies do. Uh, the question was, you know, so, so who should one go visit? Uh, I think it depends uh, a lot on uh, you know, the, the proceeding that you're interested in. Uh, I don't think I, I go down the list, and I don't have a very good list of this off the top of my head. 
of people to go visit. Uh, as Dan said, you know, you could go, you know, the, the, the labs in Columbia, Maryland. Probably the first port of call uh, would be the Federal Communication Commission in Washington, D.C. If there is one, one way to figure out who to call is if, if, you, um, if there's a proceeding that you're interested in, the, the FTC usually has official documents, but they also have public notices, which are like press releases. If you read the press release, at the bottom of the press release, there's usually, for more information, contact, and they give you the name of the FCC staffer, their email address, and their phone number. Call them. Uh, the point about the STAs, the temporary licenses, um, I don't have any comment other than to say, great point, that's a, a very useful tool. Uh, and people, you know, bear that in mind. Look up temporary licenses, experimental licenses. There were some changes uh, in a few years ago that made that easier. Um, and the last point, the, the, the odd and troubling phenomenon that they're all a bunch of lawyers. Actually, I think there has been an FCC commissioner, at least one that was an economist. Um, <laughs> it is odd and troubling, but because the commission is politically appointed, and the way you get to be on the FCC, there, there are two ways to get on the FCC. One is, you work as a staffer for a member of Congress because essentially the, the ranking members of Congress get to put forward the names for commissioners. So most commissioners you will find have been staffers up on Capitol Hill. Uh, the other way to uh, become a, a, a commissioner, or actually to become chairman, uh, is to raise a lot of money for the person who wins a presidential election. Uh, that's the way it works. Um, there are people like Dale Hatfield, who's here in Boulder, and I, I sort of say here, here, whenever Dale says this, who are trying very hard to encourage the, the offices of the commissioners and the FCC as a whole to have more technical resources. The FCC, a few years ago, started appointing an S, a, a, a chief technology officer. Uh, so there are small pieces of movement. In the absence of a change in the institution, the best we can do, you know, if the mountain won't go to Muhammad, Muhammad has to go to the mountain, go, you should go visit them and provide that input. So I think that was the set of questions. I think we may be out of time. No, another 10 minutes, fabulous. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, we have uh, one in the back and one in the front. All right, so I want to flip this around a little bit, and this is this comes from Paul Kaladzi and I were talking a while ago, and you know he made the comment that lawyers look at history and precedence, and engineers look to the future. Yeah. So, and then I think about a, another friend of mine who was uh, working with John McCarthy, the famous computer scientist who invented Lisp, and uh, Craig Partridge, John McCarthy says to him, "What are you doing?" He says, "Well, I'm trying to think about the next ten years of of the you know my research and the next ten years what I want to do in wireless communications." And McCarthy says to him. Look, unless you're looking 30 years in the future, you're just doing product development. So, given where we are today, if we just had the FCC just stop, mm -hmm. 30 years in the future, what does Spectrum look like? What does the technology look like? Wow, great question. Yeah. Next question. So, uh, in, a, in a climate where, uh, a, a, I would say, a vast majority or, or a significant chunk of Americans believe that uh, tools aren't what's problematic. People are the problem. This mm -hmm. comes across in other debates uh, as to restricting things. Yeah. Uh, do we really have anything to worry about? You know, or would it be that if the commission tried to regulate these things, people would come out fiercely saying, you know, that the technology is not evil; it's the people using it who are. Great. The grassroots will rise up. Very good. Any other comments, thoughts? I haven't heard any criticism yet of the way I thought of things and framed it. Uh, what did I get wrong? Any other, any other thoughts? OK, so you can think about that while I respond to these two. Um, these are both really interesting questions. If the FCC just stopped, asks Tom, you know, what, what does the future look like? Um, Boy, the, th the thing that occurs to me is, um, let's think about ancient Egypt. Um, the pyramids were built about 3,000 years ago. Um, and you know that dynasty just stopped. The pyramids are still there. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're in uh, you know, North Africa or Southern Europe, there's a lot of Roman stuff lying around. And in fact, if you drive along the roads 
uh, in southern Europe, very often they're long and straight. Why are they long and straight? Well, because the Roman legionaries built them. So infrastructure doesn't go away. And the rules that the FCC makes, they're not physical infrastructure, but they're institutional infrastructure. So if the FCC just stops, those rules are just going to sit there. And we're going to keep living in those rules. Um, I think one of the, there, there is a school of thought that's, that says uh, less regulation is better. And so uh, let's, let's abolish the FCC. Typically, what they mean is the FCC's ability to regulate the internet uh, and impose things like net neutrality requirements. They don't mean the FCC's ability to issue licenses and manage uh, uh, and prevent harmful interference. Um, I think if, if, if the premise that the FCC just stops is that the FCC stops making new rules, um, things will go backwards very fast because you know going back to the the incumbents and the regulatory capture, uh, you have to fight really hard to make the FCC change anything because everybody who's at the FCC three times a day, every day of the week, are there trying to stop things changing. So you have to fight to get movement. Uh, there's another, an, another angle on that, uh, which I need to think a lot more, but I suspect some of you in this room have thought a lot about, is does the kind of technology that you're working on, so Matt Edis was saying yesterday, you know, he got into building his equipment by accident because he needed a software radio to do dynamic spectrum access, and he couldn't buy one, so he had to build one. What he was interested in was DSA. And so there is a school of thought that says DSA actually obviates the FCC. Uh, I don't think it does because you have to make quite aggressive assumptions about everybody's, uh, everybody's well-intentioned and the good player. Uh, in the absence of that, you're always going to need sheriffs and rule makers. But that's another conversation to have. To this question of, um, you know, uh, radios don't kill people, people kill people. Um, th I think that, of course, I mean, it's like you know, the, the, the false premise I set up in the title of my talk. It's never either or. It's always both and. So we can all agree on that. I think the, the hope that if the FCC does something that we might consider stupid, uh, that the grassroots will rise up and will fix the problem, uh, is possible but improbable. It's possible and it's more possible now because we actually saw what happened with net neutrality where the, there was a huge grassroots roots movement that was motivated by John Oliver, not really by the deep technical substance of what the issues were, that actually got the outcome that they wanted. Um, I think that was because everybody gets internet access. The, the problem, and this is a real tragedy as a spectrum policy geek, is uh, nobody, re nobody except me and a few other people seem to think that spectrum policy is sexy. You know, I think it's deeply interesting, but most people simply do not care. Um, and once the rules get made, it'll create a, sort of an incumbent environment around it, uh, and it's really going to be hard to unmake. Good. Any other uh, closing comments or questions? With that, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Pierre.